Are there really enemies in the church? You are not accountable to the Ten Commandments. You're not accountable to the Jewish law. We're done with that. God has done something new. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, we visit with Pastor Kerry Gordon, one of the producers of the film, Enemies Within the Church. Who are these enemies, and how did they get entrenched in our churches, seminaries, and Bible schools? And what is their agenda? We'll get answers to these questions and more this hour. Trevor, you've looked at the evidence concerning the Southern Baptist Convention. What are your thoughts? If you look at it from a left-wing point of view, the Southern Baptists were one of the last bastions of true Christianity in America and very socially and politically conservative. So if you could conquer the Southern Baptists and move them to the left, you could move the whole politics of the South and, and, and America to the left. It would be a major conquest. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it in a purely secular way, this was a battle fought by the left to conquer and take over the Southern Baptists like they've taken over universities, like they've taken over Hollywood. It was just another institution on their list. And welcome to the program. Say, just because I had to take this week off of current programming, I am airing a best of broadcast. I hope you enjoy it. Are there enemies within the church? Well, a film that this ministry carries says that there are. As a matter of fact, this film is titled Enemies Within the Church, and it names some of those the producers found to be, well, unsound theologically and more. We're going to get into all of that. I opened with a little clip of Andy Stanley saying, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. So you know we have some problems in the church when high-profile pastors are saying things that are, let's say, reckless. Now, the Bible predicts a falling away from an already fallen world. Bible predicts that people will not give heed to sound doctrine, Second Timothy 4. There will be wolves among the flock, Matthew 7. People will follow after the doctrine of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. There will be some, upon hearing this, who may object to this broadcast or the entire production that we carry enemies within the church. The film does name those they feel who are bringing harm to the church, and we'll talk about that the entire hour. What do we do, as I just said a moment ago, with an Andy Stanley who says we don't need the Old Testament any longer? Jesus talked about the Old Testament all the time. What do we do with a prominent Southern Baptist pastor, J.D. Greer, who says as it concerns homosexuality that God only whispers with the suggestion that maybe evangelicals are overreacting? Well, you hear me refer on this program to the woke church. We're going to talk about that this hour. And you may be attending one, and you may want to flee from it if you are. I mean, wokeness is an enemy within the church. So I'm going to be playing a number of sound bites this hour from the film. Again, you can see these clips by watching the video version of this program. We post the video version to our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. Go to radio. We post the video version on our YouTube channel, on our Rumble channel, on his channel. Or again, you can get the product that we're talking about. It's in my online store. It's a two-hour film. We're offering it for $12, or you can call my office. I'll say more about that as we move into the program. Now, as a spokesman for the film, I'm so pleased to be featuring Pastor Kerry Gordon. He pastors Cornerstone World Outreach. That is in Sioux City, Iowa. It's Independent Church. Pastor Kerry Gordon, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to get to speak with you and all of your audience. Thank you. Now, the producers of this film, including Trevor Loudon, who, by the way, I know and have had on air three, four times, and Trevor is an authority on communism in America, he suggests... Carry that Marxism is not just moving into the church, that it has now entrenched itself in the Western church. In other words, the Jim Wallaces of the world, a wolf to be sure, have been very successful as posing as promoters of Christian theology when in fact his real love is Marxist ideology. 
And quite frankly, Carrie, as I prepared for this film, I didn't know where to begin. I was simply overwhelmed with all the evidence you are producing. When you think about it, Jan, 58% of millennials, people 25 to 40 year olds, and they vote 58% of the young people in our country. They want socialism and mm-hmm. they want Marxism. And you couple that with a church that is, by the decade, shrinking. The number of Americans that attend church faithfully on a Sunday has been shrinking for a very long time. And so the church has this desire to be relevant. We have what we call user-friendly churches. Mm-hmm. Dress down, dumb it down, water down the pulpit. And these pastors go through so much rigor to try to find ways to market their church and get more people to attend. And I think many of them are motivated by they're better angels. They want to be able to talk about Jesus to people. They want people to come to church. Okay. But they make compromises and they do things that they shouldn't be doing to try to attract people who have depraved minds and are essentially the children of the devil. What happens is compromises are made in order to seem relevant and to cause more people to sit down on Sunday. And I think a lot of ministers are adopting the language, the lingo, and the thinking of Marxism because it's popular. All right. And they want young married couples in their church. Sure. And maybe they don't realize how dangerous this is and what the ramifications are, but there are others that are not doing this because they're naive. They're doing this because they actually believe Jesus was a socialist. They actually teach Jesus was a martyr. Right. So we've got both of those facets to deal with. You spend a lot of time in this film on the Southern Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist Seminary, flagship for the Southern Baptist. I have a lot of listeners who are Southern Baptists. They are very sound and they're very solid, and many of them have pastors that are very sound and very solid. So I don't think you're suggesting that everybody who's a part of the Southern Baptist scene is in the same boat of apostasy, correct? Thankfully not, no. And the Southern Baptist Church, it has been such a powerful influence in American history. I don't think we would have had President Ronald Reagan emerge had it not been for these great people. And when we started the movie... We just put out a plea, help us. If you've got information, reach out to us and share it with us. We began looking for people with stories to tell. We wanted to give a voice to people who are being smashed in a cancel culture that aren't allowed to speak. And what we found was this mad rush of Southern Baptist members coming and saying, we've got stories to tell. We couldn't believe how many people came from the Southern Baptist sector of the American church to talk to us as a movie team. And we realized something terrible was happening. So we began investigating and digging down. And I think what's happening, if you could take yourself back to the late 1960s and think of what it must have been like when the Episcopal denomination began to implode Mm -hmm. on itself in Mm -hmm. total theological liberalism. And we look back with awe and wonder, how could such great denominations filled with such excited, wonderful people, like the Methodist Church, for example, a once nation-shaking group of Christians, Charles Wesley, how do these great people collapse and go into such darkness. Well, I think it's happening right in front of us, right. unfortunately, with the latest. This is the tip of the spirits, the Southern Baptist Convention. They are imploding. They are leaning into the left. It's very clear, and it's very frightening for the future of America. Well, Carrie, I want to play some clips from the film, because you focus like a laser beam actually on a number of issues certainly not exclusively critical race theory, social justice, but these two, critical race theory, social justice, are tearing apart the church. Social justice is a euphemism for uh, Marxism. Fairness, the same basic outcomes. You know, if, if, if you're a billionaire, then I should be a billionaire. And so many of our churches, and especially our urban churches, they're encouraging people to look at the things of this world mm-hmm. and bemoan the relative position mm. that we have within our community. And look at all these other communities. You know, it's sold as a way to improve people's lives, to give people more security, to, to help people. It's not, it's a way to enslave them. It's a way to mislead them. And it's a way to give certain unscrupulous people way more power than they ever should have. What I see happening is the evangelical movement, as it concerns critical race theory, social justice, some other things we're going to talk about as well, are following in the dangerous footsteps 
of the Methodists, of the various very liberal denominations, I don't think we have to name them all, you just name Methodists, but some of the Lutheran denominations, they went down a wrong path some 100 years ago, but now we've got evangelicals doing it, and they're toying around, again, with social justice, critical race theory, LGBTQ, etc., making the same mistakes. Yes, history is just repeating. It seems like it begins with denying the inerrancy of Scripture. Mm -hmm. That's the first critical step, which is devastating, and that war has been fought for many years in many denominations. But once you unhinge from the absolutes of the moral laws of God in the Old Testament, literally everything in the New Testament, when unhinged from the Old, becomes very much moral relativism. It's humanism with Christianese layered over top of it. That's what's really happening. We sometimes refer to that as pop psychology or pop Christianity. The intersectionality is a wonderful way to allure people thinking that we're talking about Christian themes. For example, racism. What Christian would ever support racism? Racism is antithetical to anything in the scriptures, Mm -hmm. but it is an emotional thing because we're lawless. We're not conditioned in America today anyway to use synthesis, antithesis, thesis, antithesis thinking. We're very emotion driven. So everything is about how do I feel? They have mastered the art, I say they, I mean Marxists or socialists, mastered the art of touching Christian hot buttons of emotions, where we have very bad feelings about racism, and we should. And we have terrible feelings about people being mistreated because of some particular characteristic in their life, and we should feel that way. But they exploit those good emotions, the desire that everyone would be treated well, and then they pull us into error. It is a really deviant, dangerous thing. I played a clip introducing the program of Trevor Loudon, and again, he clarified in the intro that the Southern Baptist, the last bastion of true Christianity and the left, is saying, if we can conquer the Southern Baptists, we can shift the entire South to the left. So this was a planned strategy, and I think you say in the film that maybe a starting date we could consider would be about 1973. Would that be right? Well, in 1973, you have two things happening at the same time that are really major tipping points in American history. One, the Republican-dominated Supreme Court rules in the infamous Roe v. Wade for the alleged right to kill children in the womb. And then at that same moment, there is a coup d'etat going on inside the American Psychiatric Association where secret, closeted, homosexual psychologists have strategically taken over the ruling board of the APA and then voted almost unanimously after they took over almost every seat to remove their sin from the list of psychiatric disorders, Mm -hmm. declaring themselves perfectly mentally normal. So this combination of the sexual deviancy in one hand that creates children out of wedlock with heterosexuality and then homosexuality, which is clearly forbidden in the scripture, Through the area of sex and the 1960s cultural movement of free love and all of this in this perfect moment with truly Satan stirring the pot, America starts heading down a very destructive road and the ramifications now are men are claiming that they're women. You've got the same exact people that say we were born gay. You flip it around five minutes later, they say, well, we weren't born any gender at all. And it seems so crazy. But really, there is a method to the madness. They have a goal, and they're not concerned at all about looking hypocritical. They don't care. Their consciences have been damaged. Their goal is to obtain power and to reshape America into the kind of socialist utopia that they want it to be, which is in total contrast with what the Founding Fathers designed us to be as a nation. I want to play one more clip. It's between human legs. But even if they do try, and who knows if they actually will try, Will they get sued for discrimination and hate? Will they be bigots like the rest of us? If you look at who founded the modern gay rights movement in this country, it was a man called Harry Hay, and he founded the Mattachine Society and other radical gay groups in the 40s and 50s and was a very active Communist Party member. He left the Communist Party because he could do more good for the cause without the Communist Party label. He remained a communist till the day he died. And he is absolutely the father of the modern gay rights movement. Now you have to understand with these movements, 
It's not about the movement. The issue is not the issue. The issue is the revolution. How do you break down the American family? How do you break down American Christianity? One of the best ways to do it is to turn homosexuals into a, an accepted minority that must be atoned to, that must be both accepted into your society and made to be even above normal. They must have more rights than everyone else. It would appear that quite a few other sins are more egregious in God's eyes than homosexuality. Jen Wilkin, who's one of our favorite Bible teachers here and who's actually leading our women's conference, she said, she said, we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about, and we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. Now the LGBTQ movement, as they call it in these days, has made huge inroads in Christian churches in this country. Most, many Christian churches have gone from holding homosexuality as a sin to welcoming homosexuals into their church and apologizing for their past unaccepting behavior. At a Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission conference, Al Mohler repented, used that word, for denying same-sex orientation. What? He believes that homosexuality is an innate orientation. He repented for having taken a biblical position on sexual behavior? Yes. He repented he for repented being of biblical. It. One of the embarrassments that I have to bear is that I have written on some of these issues now for nearly 30 years, and, and at a couple of points, I have to say, I got that wrong, and we got to go back and correct it, correct it by scripture. Now, early in this controversy, I felt it quite necessary in order to, to make clear the gospel to deny anything like a sexual orientation. And uh, speaking at an event for the National Association of Evangelicals 20-something years ago, I, I made that point. I repent of that. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Sioux City, Iowa, Pastor Kerry Gordon of the Cornerstone World Outreach. He is one of the producers of the film Enemies Within the Church. We carry it. It's in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can call my office. You can get on our newsletter lists. Pastor Kerry Gordon, we just made some people upset and angry. I played a clip of J.D. Greer saying, we need to whisper about homosexuality because the Bible whispers about it, supposedly. I guess I wouldn't agree with that. And then we played a clip here of Al Mohler, who is repenting for his position on homosexuality. Help us understand what we just heard. It's a tragedy. It's a terrible tragedy. And I have to tell you, when we started this road three and a half years ago, making the film, one of the biggest hurdles I had to overcome was what was happening with Al Mohler, because I had always looked up to him in so many ways. I had quoted so him I. favorably from the pulpit. He's written marvelous things and published really insightful things about the Scripture for over 20 years that I've relied upon and trusted him. And I did get to meet him one time many years ago concerning Christian education. He and I ended up having lunch, and so I don't know him really well, but I've always looked up to him and thought well of him. And I was very careful. You don't want to come across as a curmudgeon right. about to throw bombs and slander people. I'm very sensitive to that. I've been a pastor for 28 years. I know what it's like to have people spread rumors or say things that are unfair and untrue about you, trying to tear you down. Having sensitivity as a minister, I would never want to put another minister through what I have gone through in my own life, and what my father went through before me and my grandfather before him. I'm three generations deep in ministry. I have a sensitivity toward preachers, and I understand the difficulties of ministry. So I am extremely careful, and I also believe in the law of sowing and reaping. So I was very challenged by the problems with Al Mohler, and I just was devastated, I have to say that on the air. I was devastated to see how bad things were. I couldn't tell you exactly why Al Mohler has compromised the authority of the Scripture over human sexuality. I don't know for sure why, but I can tell you that when I sat down with person after person after person who was directly involved in being fired from the university he was in control of, and heard the stories and the board meetings and saw the evidence, it was overwhelming, and it was very clear that Al Mohler has either consciously decided to embrace a form of Christian humanism, or he has just caved in 
maybe out of fear or perhaps cowardice, but he has surrendered to the forces of evil in this culture. And I don't know why he's done it. I pray for him. I hope, I think all of our hope in creating the film is that perhaps he would come to repentance and actually repent for the correct thing this sure. time, instead of repenting for previously believing what the Scripture said about homosexuality. Well, like you, I have been one who has deeply appreciated what Dr. Albert Moeller did for the Southern Seminary in Kentucky. Thirty years ago, he began turning the seminary around in a very positive way, and I think he's been a hero of the faith for our generation Has woke ideology gotten to the seminary, starting with Dr. Moeller at the top? It would be nice, perhaps, to even have Dr. Moeller on air and talk to him about some of these things. But I share your grief, Pastor Kerry Gordon. I do. The clip we've just played, folks, is a part, again, of the film that we're carrying. And it's looking at a lot of the things that have gone haywire in the church here in the last 40, 50 years or so. Pastor Gordon, you said that making this film was very difficult for all involved, and my goodness, I can see why. And you said, who wants to know all the things that are revealed? And then you say some pastors and leaders who watched the film actually had renewed hope after they saw the film. Explain what you mean by that. I have heard that repeated over and over. In fact, about 30 minutes before we began this interview, I got a phone call, and another minister I've never met said the same thing. The end of the film is true biblical hope. This is what we give you. We're not giving you what I call hopium. We're not trying to be Pollyannish about the future. But we get down to the brass tacks of the Scripture, and we know that our hope has always been in the power and authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King, seated on his throne. We know how this ends. He wins. He's the victor. He's the champion. There's no reason for us to all go dig a bunker and store up our canned goods just because The church is in serious trouble in the West. America is in great peril right now. Our freedoms are on the line. This is all real, and it's a real problem, but there is the very real possibility of a divine intervention. We could have a great revival. We could have another great awakening. Mm -hmm. I would call it even a resurrection, because I think we're a dead nation spiritually. It has to be through Jesus Christ, not politics alone. You can learn more at their website, enemieswithinthechurch.com, enemieswithinthechurch.com. You might go to a particular category at that website that I found intriguing. Go to the category called Wokipedia. You'll learn some things if you go to enemiesinthechurch.com and go to Wokipedia. That's just a link on that website. And then you said in another interview, Pastor Kerry Gordon, you said, after you sent the film to a particular organization, the Southern Baptist Seminary started scrubbing their website of critical race theory slash social justice articles and videos. Very interesting. Oh, yes. They had chronicled many, many excerpts that we had been looking at for three and a half years of their professors openly, clearly promoting critical race theory, which is a total heresy, aggressively promoting it. And as soon as our movie began to make enough waves, all of that footage magically disappeared Mm -hmm. in one weekend and was taken from their website. I think what happens is these seminaries know exactly what they're doing, and they also realize that some of their biggest donors would not appreciate that. And so in order to protect their finances, they pretend it's not happening. They're really being dishonest, and they remove all the evidence but we're wise enough to have recorded that evidence ourselves. Well, I want to pick on one more Southern Baptist. Now, Russell Moore has stepped down from the seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Thankfully, I'm so pleased to see that the film is dedicated to my friend Phil Haney. And I was with Phil two weeks before he was murdered a couple of years ago. And he said, just like he said to you folks, Phil said to me, if I turn up dead, folks, I didn't commit suicide. They'll say I committed suicide, but I didn't do that. You play a clip of Phil, let's play that, because he's going to be addressing the Russell Moore situation. Russell Moore, who is, I think, the main person who is responsible for this, at least in the Southern Baptist Convention, Al Mola brought him on maybe 20 years ago, I don't know the precise time, but he's been a served as a professor. He served as a provost and the dean. So he had very responsible positions at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. And then he was in in 2013, or maybe it was 2015, he took over from Richard Land 
is president of the ERLC. They have a budget of five or six million a year, and they have about 30 staff. And it's turned into a honestly, genuinely leftist social justice arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's like the Southern Baptist Convention has got this cancer, and it's very disturbing, very disconcerting. In 2015, the George Soros Foundation said this, Reverend Russell Moore, head of the public policy for the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, and then they quote Russell Moore as saying that evangelicals should be the ones calling the rest of the world to remember human dignity and the image of God, especially for those fleeing murderous Islamic radical jihadis. Now, so Russell Moore is forwarding immigrants from Muslim countries coming to the United States. There is a link to George Soros. Now, why would George Soros want to fund Russell Moore? And, and why would his organization be bragging that this is what Russell Moore said with our money? My name is Philip B. Haney, and I became a spirit-filled Christian November 7, 1975. And that's really the basis of my worldview. What made me more of a public figure was being a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security, and I worked in Customs and Border Protection and I was a subject matter expert in the strategy and tactics of the global Islamic movement. And I literally interviewed hundreds of individuals seeking entry into the country who had potential ties to terrorism. Tell me what you think about the ERLC under the leadership of Russell Moore getting involved with the United States State Department and encouraging them to build a mosque not only the United States State Department, but also the Justice Department. Ever since Loretta Lynch and my former boss, Janet Napolitano, they began forcing communities to violate their own zoning laws, but also paying the Muslim community damages for their bias, their racism, their Islamophobia. That started during the Obama administration. It makes Russell Moore and the ERLC an accessory to a spiritual and theological crime. A kind of an enablement. You're advocating on behalf of a theology, an ideology that's in direct contradiction to the one that you say you live by. That's a kind of a psychosis, isn't it? Who is the primary abuser of Christians all over the world today? The very religion, Islam, that this particular individual is trying to help build a mosque against the wishes of the entire community. I would like to know how in the world someone within the Southern Baptist Convention can support the defending of rights for Muslims to construct mosques in the United States when these people threaten our very way of existence as Christians and Americans. Sometimes we have to deal with questions that are really complicated and we have to spend a lot of time thinking them through and, and, and not sure exactly uh, what the final result was going to be. Sometimes we have really hard decisions to make. This isn't one of those things. What it means to be a Baptist is to support soul freedom for everybody. Russell Moore has taken money from, from this uh, individual. Russell Moore has also taken money uh, from the Democracy Fund. $50,000 went to the MLK 50 conference. Why would the Democracy Fund, an openly uh, leftist organization, want to fund an evangelical conference that gave Southern Baptist students at seminary credits to attend? Again, another clip from the film We Carry, Enemies Within the Church. Find it in my online store, olivetreeviews.org. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell, airing best of programming this week. And I have on the line from Sioux City, Iowa, Pastor Kerry Gordon, Cornerstone World Outreach. Pastor Kerry Gordon, okay, Russell Moore has thankfully stepped down from Southern Baptist Seminary. But talk to me about this clip we played. It's from your film. Russell Moore actively participated in aiding and helping to build mosques in the United States after 9-11. And I think we can all see strategically that that is a pole position, that is a dominion flag mm -hmm. for Islam, that right after they kill thousands of innocent people on 9-11 in New York, they fought and won to build a mosque as close as possible to the site where those buildings were collapsed. And this is the way Islam works, is their sign of conquest. They, by building the mosque, 
send a signal to other would-be terrorists around the world, we are winning, we are taking over. And, of course, it's not branded that way. They said, no, we just believe in the First Amendment. We just want to have freedom of religion. And I'm all for the freedom of religion for everyone, even wrong religions. And I'll say that very openly and clearly because I believe that Christianity is the only true religion and that the truth always wins. And Christianity doesn't need to be worried about competition because it will defeat its competition because its competition is based on lies. However... Islam is a special case because they kill people, and the only way that you should ever allow an Islamic mosque to be built in the United States is if they will publicly disavow the fifth pillar of Islam, which is jihad. That is not being done. So what you have is a leading voice of the Southern Baptist Church helping people who will not renounce the fifth pillar of Islam build mosques to plant a flag of dominion in the United States, and it's treacherous. And it's evil. And frankly, if I were Satan, that's how I would do it. I think, Pastor Gordon, the thing that troubles me, and I want to make just a little diversion here. Russell Moore had connections to George Soros, which is something I don't quite understand. I cannot imagine how money is such an enticer that evangelicals or supposed evangelicals yoke with the likes of George Soros, another hardcore communist other than end time strong delusion. But just a little aside here, and I'm not sure if you even have any thought on it. I have followed the National Association of Evangelicals since the 1980s. They were such a sound outfit. They were founded before my time. I believe they were founded in 1942 because they were founded to come up against the National Council of Churches, which was totally leftist even way back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And yet, by the 90s, they were going so far left under Richard Sizek. It was just shocking. Then in 2011, they came out, I'm reading from their website, a 2011 position paper on nuclear weapons. The National Association of Evangelicals, we unite in deploring the mindset that assumes the way to solve problems, meaning nuclear problems, is might and power. Then they say, we should never forget that we are to love our enemies, Matthew 5, and overcome evil with good. All that's fine, but the Bible says to love our enemies, but North Korea and China and Iran aren't going to think twice about obliterating America with nuclear weapons. And yet the NAE came up with a totally Democrat Party suggestion that we banish America's nuclear weapons. So here again, we've left Southern Baptist Convention and gone to the National Association of Evangelicals, Kerry Gordon, and the drama is just as bad. Yes, and it's usually built on a fallacious either-or dichotomy. I mean, think about this. Jesus said, turn the other cheek, love your enemies. So when a man breaks into your house and announces with the gunpoint, I'm going to rape your wife and kill your children, then are you really supposed to offer to make him a ham sandwich? And so when the Bible tells us to love our enemies, it is not saying to love them to the extent that we actually are showing neglect and hatred for our own loved ones. And so when you're dealing with the realities of the world, the scriptures are not telling us that Jesus was so loving and we're called to be so loving that he actually came to make the world softer on crime or that we should not realize that there is an inevitability that when the Scripture says you're to be at peace as much as possible with all that lieth within you, we should be inferring that it isn't always possible to stay at peace with everybody. Yes. And Jesus in Matthew 23 was quite fierce. We're busy sitting at the table of influence that Jesus would have been flipping over. When we love our enemies, it is not at the expense of our family and our fellow citizens. So we do have to have a rigorous defense. Yeah. And I say love is shown and a military man who's willing to die for his country, he's not necessarily engaged in war and firing a gun or missiles or anything else because he hates the bad guys so much, but perhaps he's really being motivated by a love for home, and his children, and his way of life so much that he's willing to fight evil. So the Bible does not teach this false dichotomy. I have to love enemies to the point where I neglect my own family. We're to strive to be at peace as much as lieth within us understanding it isn't always possible, not even for God. Lucifer betrayed him. Lucifer took one-third of heaven, and this is a reality we have to deal with. If it was done to God, then we are going to have warfare as well. Revelation says, I beheld Michael and his angels, and they warred with the dragon. I mean, God doesn't escape war, neither can we. 
so we have to be militant at times, just like heaven is, and Michael is armed with a sword, and he fights. So must we in this world, and most frightening of all is Jesus' has promised he will return, and he will come warring against That's evil. Right. So That's right. We should not shirk from battle against evil. I think part of my point is National Association of Evangelicals is also a part of the Evangelical Immigration Table, which is another outfit funded totally by George Soros. I think the question I'm asking anyway is why on earth are evangelical outfits yoking with one of the most evil men on the planet, George Soros? Is the money that enticing that that's who we now yoke with? Another person you raise, Kerry Gordon, and let's play this clip and come back and talk about it because you have a problem, as do I, with the late Pastor Tim Keller. Tim Keller is probably the biggest operative pushing the evangelical church to the left. Um, as a young man, he was on the left. Tom Skinner um, talked about systemic oppression, racism in the United States, in policing and these kinds of things. And most importantly, taught Keller that the, the gospel itself that the fundamentalists had and the gospel of the social gospel needed to both be wedded together. And Tim Keller took that to heart. He listened to the lecture by Tom Skinner at Urbana 70, where he made this argument multiple times. He said it changed his world. Elwood Ellis, his classmate at uh, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, told Tim Keller that him and his girlfriend he was dating, who became his wife, essentially were racists. And the reason was, was because that they um, imposed, uh, without, without thinking about any alternatives, their white uh, their white societal norms and benefited from a system that allocated privilege to him and so he listened to this and took it well and absorbed it and then of course harvey Kahn, when he was at westminster theological seminary taught him kind of a new way to look at the bible a new hermeneutic called the hermeneutical spiral and there's a synthesis between the two the, between the the audience interpretation uh in, in their world and then the world of the authors of scripture and that's how you come up with meaning Okay, Pastor Gordon, talk to us a little bit here about how you've worked Tim Keller into the production. Tim Keller is a man, I give you this illustration, when you use Venetian blinds on a window, you can turn that little rod and the angle of the blinds will change and they will block out mm -hmm. whatever degree of light you wish for them to block out and you will see only a limited view of what's on the other side of the window. I truly believe men like Tim Keller believe themselves. I don't think he gets up in the morning and he says, I'm going to go deceive everybody and trick them into believing in Marxist or communitarian ideas. I think he really reads the Bible through his own Venetian blinds that he openly, admittedly says he adapted and accepted long ago in his life. When he reads the scripture, he sees Jesus as some kind of benevolent socialist. Okay. He really believes that there is a way for Christian Marxism to help the world, and I think he's motivated by believing wrong ideas. And that's why he is so dangerous, because he really believes it, and he's gifted. He's a wonderful communicator. He's very loved by many, many people. But ultimately, if you dig down, he tells you in his own publications that he is essentially a communitarian, which is a word for socialist that doesn't draw so much fire and stigma as just saying, hey, I'm a socialist, I just believe in Christian socialism, sure. I think Jesus was a socialist. He probably won't ever say that, but he'll call himself a communitarian. And he is exploiting the desire in millennials between 25 and 40 years old. They believe Jesus was a socialist. Okay. They think socialism is good. They don't want capitalism. They don't want free markets in America. They're looking for political ways to change our country. Tim Keller has got a great dog whistle. And they're following him, and he's the Pied Piper leading us to destruction. So we have to call it out and say, this is wrong. It's got to stop. Again, the product is Enemies Within the Church. It's a DVD, a couple hours. It's in my online store, oliveTreeViews.org. You can learn more. You can find it at EnemiesWithinTheChurch.com, EnemiesWithinTheChurch.com. I am talking for the hour with Pastor Kerry Gordon of Cornerstone World Outreach, Sioux City, Iowa, who is I would say the primary spokesman in the film. And you told me, Carrie, that not only did you not get paid for this film project, instead you've received a lot of grief. You've lost some friends. So obviously you're doing this because 
in your mind, you're trying to stand for truth and righteousness and purity within the gospel, etc.? Absolutely. I've been in the ministry for 28 years. I love Jesus. I love the church. There's this thing that happens when you're a pastor with social media. Men you would never allow to stand in your pulpit on a Sunday morning and teach error have complete, total access to all of the people in your local church that God has made you a caretaker of and a protector of. So there's this free flow of error and misinformation and misleading things that I can clearly see as a shepherd will harm Hmm. God's people. Strangely enough, when you want to try to bring some correction to this public free flow of error, the correction is not welcomed. (laughs) The correction is vilified. The corrector, someone like me or any of these other men in the film, there's sort of this assumption, oh, they're just bomb throwers, they're angry, they're tinfoil hats. But the truth is, the men we interviewed for this film and myself These men love America, and they love Jesus, they love the Church, and they want nothing more than to help the body of Christ thrive, because we want people to come to their senses, to come to Jesus, to repent of their sins, to be forgiven and understand what it means to be born again, and to have that wonderful relationship with God that Jesus came to give us. When you're using the social justice gospel, which is a perversion of the true gospel, you're telling the world, you're a victim and everyone has done some kind of wrong to you, and they all need to repent to you, in direct contrast with the real gospel, which is Jesus was the greatest victim in all of history, and you are not a victim. You're actually the villain. It was your sins personally committed that contributed to putting him on a cross and murdering him, and you need to repent to Father God for what you did to his son. You can't get a more stark contrast, maybe except from heaven and hell. When you look at the true gospel and what is being taught by these people that are teaching everyone, you're a victim, everyone should repent to you. And by the way, you can almost never get forgiven if you repent to a social justice warrior. I'm so sorry, I'm white, and a hundred years ago, maybe one of my relatives was a slave owner. I'm Mm. so sorry. They'll never forgive you. But the true gospel, we all contributed to the murder of the Son of God, and we do get forgiveness. We get total forgiveness. We get lifted up out of the muck and the mire and the mud, and we get called an adopted child of God. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. It's why I live. It's why I do what I do as a pastor. I think all the men in this movie feel the same way. We've got to get back to the true gospel because it's the only hope for the world, much less America. You also take a very close look at some other seminaries and Bible colleges that are simply infiltrated by, we're going to be blunt folks, by communists. The Christian college and university as an industry, as an organization, is compromised. There are very few Christian schools that I would even recommend that people consider these days. Because again, a wolf in sheep's clothing is dangerous, but a wolf in shepherd's clothing is deadly. In many ways today, I'd rather send my kids off to a state institution where at least you know the wolves are wolves and prepare the kid accordingly, then send them off to a Christian institution that is nothing but a wolf in shepherd's clothing. We need to be very careful. That is a very profound clip. It's from the movie Enemies Within the Church. My ministry carries it, and you can learn more at enemieswithinthechurch.com, olivetreeviews.org. Go to our store. Carrie, I want you to tell the story briefly, and that we are down to a few minutes left here. The story that you bring out in the film, which is gripping, would be that of a First Baptist Church of Naples, Florida, because race seemed to be the key element in the, well, not implosion, but near implosion of that church. 700 left the church over this incident. 19 people were excommunicated from First Baptist Naples for racism. Hundreds voted against an incoming black pastor. They felt he was not qualified had nothing to do with the race, and you interviewed many of these individuals. And this is all the effects of this horrific critical race theory, because it tried to make the church woke. What happened there? What happened there was very obvious to us after we interviewed all of the people who were excommunicated and everyone who had been accused of racism on a public national level, by the way. After looking at all the evidence, not only was there not a single case of racism involved in anything that had to do with that, 
what happened was a woke pastor who is a progressive and who happened to have a dark melanin in their skin rose up and tried to get the senior pastorate position. They were heavily pushed by the Southern Baptist Convention to take over one of the most powerful and thriving Southern Baptist churches in the United States in one of the richest areas yes. of the United States, politically Correct. one of the most influential areas in the swing state of Florida. And it seemed to have direct political implications. The Southern Baptist Convention sent an operative to take the church. He was wholly unqualified by all of the rules of qualifications of all candidates to take the position after the retirement of the previous pastor. And he didn't meet any of the qualifications, so these people voted no. Plus, they saw on his social media that he was aggressively promoting Black Lives Matter, which is a gross Marxist, hard-left organization that, frankly, blasphemes Jesus. And those kinds of things rose even more red flags that clearly he was not the right person for the job. They were accused of racism, totally slandered. I'll give you two examples, two of the people I interviewed. One of them is this beautiful old man and his wife. Come to find out that 25 or 30 years ago, he had such compassion on orphans in Africa that he went and started an orphanage personally with his wealth, very wealthy man, paid for all of the children to be educated, brought them up until they became adults, paid for their college educations, helped them find their spouses and attended their weddings. He is called Papa this day when he goes back to Africa. All these beautiful African people call him Daddy. He loved these African people, used his own money, brings up a whole generation of orphans. They're now successful adults. They accused him of being a racist. Another example, this is how preposterous it is. A law enforcement officer and his wife were accused of racism. Turns out they're foster parents, mm. and they have red, yellow, black, and white children in their house that they love as their own, and they say, we're all of one race. We all have red blood. And these are the types of people sure. that were accused of racism. So it was another coup d'etat, an attempt to take a strong strategic position in the political war of America by putting in a woke, hard-left pastor into a position in a very conservative church, and the people said no, and then they were punished for saying no. Again, folks, this is critical race theory in action. It is social justice in action. Play one more clip. Have you seen the infiltration of the social justice gospel in your school? Absolutely. I've seen a real shift at Southern Seminary, let's say in the last five to six years, there's been a, a real shift toward the left. And so again, we have guys teaching postmodernism, social justice, and of course, critical race theory. And you hear all the buzzwords. This is coming from the very top. So you have people like Matt Hall, who is now, you know, the second person. I mean, he's the provost. He teaches textbook critical race theory, using all the buzz terms, using all the concepts. Which is total heresy. You cannot take a secular doctrine, combine it with scripture without distorting and perverting the gospel. It's absolutely impossible. He'll say, I, I, I don't believe in critical race theory, but go look at the videos. They're readily available. And by the way, in a meeting, Al Mohler himself started using the very vocabulary. And he, he meant it. He, he talked about the problems of whiteness and white privilege. White privilege. Yeah, absolutely. And then he started talking about systemic racism. And then finally, one of the last things he said, he said, Marxism has insights. And he said that in- Al Mohler said this. Yes. Marxism has insight. That's right. And remember the context. He's already using the word whiteness as if he's accepting it. At another faculty meeting earlier in that year, he said, listen, I don't agree with all the solutions that critical race theory offers for the racial problems, but they are seeing the problems correctly. Therefore, what he's saying is there's, there's a problem with whiteness. There's a problem with white privilege. They're, you know, he's agreeing with how they're seeing the problems of society. We need to see things. How does the Bible see things? Not critical race theory. The film makes a case that the term woke, W-O-K-E, actually stands for willfully overlooking known evil. Woke, willfully overlooking known evil. Again, the film Enemies Within the Church. Find out more. OliveTreeViews.org or enemieswithinthechurch.com. I've been talking for the hour 
Notice the hour was uninterrupted. I felt it should not be interrupted because of the seriousness of the content. And I wanted to emphasize the particular product that we're emphasizing as well, not for financial gain. I'm not interested in that, but because of the content that it might be able to inform you how, again, this whole leftist agenda, as Trevor Loudon has so articulately shown in other films, has infiltrated Washington and other governments of the world. Well, it's also infiltrated the church and our seminaries, our Bible schools. So, Pastor Kerry Gordon, let's look at what is the answer. I'm down to roughly three, four minutes here. How do you recommend we fix the woke problem? Obviously, be nice. We could get rid of critical race theory, social justice, the promotion of LGBTQ, probably two dozen other issues. How would you go about doing that? Essentially, ministers are called to do two things. We're to preach the true gospel that's given to us in the scripture. And in order to promote and positively preach that message, we also have to be willing to defend it from perversions of counterfeit messages that are not the true gospel. We have to do both. And when you talk about that, it makes me think of Melanchthon. And he was eulogizing Martin Luther, who brought correction at one point in our church's history during the Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther had died, and he was eulogizing him. And I have a quote. He said, some express a suspicion that Luther was too severe in his critiques. I quote Erasmus by saying, because of the magnitude of disorders in this current age, God has sent us a violent physician. And I think that God is moving in our midst. I believe that God called us to do this film. I believe it was an assignment from the Lord that I had to obey and to do, even though it did cost me friendship. Sure. It has not always been pleasant. And I have taken no funds for it. I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being in a Hollywood film. It was actually post-produced in Hollywood. I didn't want anyone to be able to say, I just did it for the money. So I said right up front, I will not accept a salary. I will not be paid. I gave three and a half years because I love Jesus. And I love everybody listening to the show. I love America. I love every sinner. I want all of you to repent. I want everyone to come to the cross. I don't care what you've done. You can be forgiven if you'll repent. That's the message. That's why we did it. And that's what we have to keep doing. There's nothing more powerful than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no demon in hell. There's no false doctrine or false religion that can withstand the power of the gospel of the Bible. So you've had some feedback now. Basically, the feedback is... Most of it has been very positive. Not all of it. Most of it has been very positive. The primary response that I hear the most is, thank you, Lord, someone finally said something. That's the response most of the time. It feels like you can see everything collapsing and everyone's too afraid to say why. So I think that the movie has been received with great relief. I think it is a difficult movie to watch. And my friend Steve Dace, who is pretty hardcore, he said it was so heavy and hard for him, he almost turned it off halfway through. He's glad that he didn't. I don't know how you feel about it. I'm so glad I became aware of it. I've seen it twice. I've seen other individual interviews of you and others. I've seen Trevor Loudon expound on it at great length. And I think so highly of Trevor. Again, worked with him for a number of years. So I thank you, Carrie, for what you've done. I know it's cost you plenty. I think great will be your reward in heaven. Let me just go out of the program. And by the way, again, folks, you could get more info at enemieswithinthechurch.com. We carry the product. Find it in my online store, olivetreeviews.org. Let me go out of the program by saying this. Christ died for his church. He loves his 